All right, so uh, we'll look at the question, then we'll go through the solution. In case you have any issue, you can post me at any time and then ask your question, okay? So the first one we are looking at is a question about PPS. So assume that Ghana's production possibilities table for two products, corn and paper, is shown below. The usual assumptions regarding production possibilities are all there. And then corn is measured in tons, while paper is measured in sheets. So these are the combinations, the possibilities, and then these are the various uh, combinations of corn and then uh, paper that can be produced. And I'm sure uh, you know the assumptions we are talking about. We are only con uh, considering the production of these two goods. All the resources in the economy are being fully utilized. And, uh, if you want to produce more of one, you have to produce less of the other. So this is a table that we have, and we have to construct a PPF from this information, where corn is supposed to be on the vertical axis, and then paper is supposed to be on the horizontal. If you change it, they can mark it down. So just obey the instruction. The, the corn is supposed to be on the vertical, and then uh, paper is supposed to be on the horizontal. So this is what you do. You can first inscribe the curve. Please, the curve is not a straight line. Okay, so you can't you can't do this. Um, you can't draw it like this. No, it is not a straight line. Okay, if you draw it like this, then it's almost like the curve has a constant uh, a constant slope, but it's not like that. Okay, so please don't 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 draw it like this. But at times. Okay. Getting the combinations is very difficult. So you can draw the curve first. The curve must look like this, okay? It's like it is protruding outside or outwards. So it has to be like this. Then you connect the points. So we know the corn is supposed to be on the vertical and corn starts from 1.8. Uh, I think this is the corn that we have I'm coming. This is corn uh, 18, uh -huh. so it's from 18. So you, you just label them, okay? Then when you come to paper two, now uh, for possibility A, corn is 18, and then paper uh, for possibility A, corn is zero, and then paper is six. So it has to be on the paper axis. So you see at this point, Point A, there's no cone, and then we have six units of paper. Then you go to point B. At point B, we have 18 units of cone, and then five units of paper. And then you, you bring your five, then you trace it. Uh, this one, I didn't go and show, you see that all the points came to the downside. Okay, you try to mm -hmm. spread them across. Uh -huh. So if the five, the B could have been at where the C is. Okay, then uh -huh. so you first draw the curve. After drawing the curve, then you deal with the co combinations, and then you make sure you label them. First, you need to label the axis. Then you label the. Uh, uh, you give numbering to the scales. Okay, you make sure you scale them, and then the combinations to you. You have to label them. Okay, so that's the first part of the question. You draw the PPF. Then the second one is what is the marginal opportunity cost of producing the first sheet of paper? The opportunity cost of producing the first sheet of paper. So if you want to produce the first sheet of paper, uh, it's this one, right? Now, when uh, they were not producing any sheet of paper, what was the unit of corn that they were producing? Yes, what was the unit of corn when they were not producing any paper at all? 63. Very good. Now, if you come to point F, they are producing only one sheet of paper. So how many units of corn are they producing now? 60, right? So how many units of corn did they sacrifice before they, they could produce just this one unit of sheet? Three. 
Very good. So you subtract this one from the highest uh, corn production. Okay. So we, we have three units of corn for gum. So the opportunity cost of producing the first sheet of paper will be the three units of corn that they forgo. I hope we understand. Yes, you understand. And then if you check the second one, the opportunity cost of producing the fourth sheet. Fourth, how many units of corn are they producing when they produce four sheets of paper? 33. So how many units did they sacrifice? You subtract this from the highest. So we have, uh, that's what we have here. That gives us 30 units of corn per corn. So the opportunity cost of producing four sheets of paper will be 30 units of corn per corn. I hope we all understand that. Yes. All right. Then let's look at the second question I have here. The market for pizza is characterized by a downward sloping demand curve and an upward sloping supply curve. So now supposing that the government forces each pizzeria to pay a $1 tax on each pizza sold, illustrate the effect of this tax on the pizza market. Be sure to label the consumer surplus producers on government revenue dead weight loss. And then how does each area compare to the pre tax case? Now, this question is just something that we use a graph to answer. We cannot do mass here because there was no demand curve or demand equation. There was no uh, equation for the supply as well. So this one, they just want us to show them graphically what happens whenever there is a tax, okay? Whenever there's a tax. So what you have to do is that first, you need to show the equilibrium point and then the various values, these things that you are talking about, the CS, the PS, government revenue, and then the deadweight loss, okay? Now, uh, first draw the equilibrium condition. So this is your supply curve, this is your demand curve. So where they meet, that's where we get our initial equilibrium at this point here, okay? So th this is your equilibrium price P star. This is your equilibrium quantity Q star. So first, let's find the consumer surplus before the tax, okay? Now, if you want to calculate for CS graphically, is the portion below the demand curve, but above price. CS is equal to the portion below the demand curve but above price. So if you look at it, is this portion here, this triangle, I hope you can see it. So before the tax, yeah. this was a total CS, okay? The, the consumers of plus that uh, the individual was enjoying. So I've labeled this ABE. So that the pre-tax CS is A and then B and then what E. If you add this, that's where you get your consumer surplus then let's look at the one for the producer before the tax for ps that is the portion above the supply curve but below the price so that one is this triangle here okay this triangle i'm sure you can see that and that is f c and then d f c and then d so this one are the pre tax uh, consumer and then producer surpluses. Okay. Now, before tax, there's no dead weight loss. You see, I didn't write the, that one at all. There's no dead weight loss at all when there's no tax. There's no dead weight loss. And then if there's no tax, there's no government revenue at all. The government is not taxing anyone. So where's the revenue coming from? So before the tax, we we'll only get this as a CS and then this as a PS. Then now there's a tax, they've imposed a $1 tax on each unit sold. So $1 tax, it will shift the supply curve to the top. It shifts it upwards. Whenever there's a tax, put that in mind. Whenever there's a tax, it affects the supply curve and it shifts it upwards, okay? It shifts it upwards. So now this is going to be the new, um, the new uh, equilibrium point. Okay, this is going to be the new equilibrium point here, okay? Now, uh, 
this tax is a quantity tax. So for quantity tax, uh, I think it's, it affects the intercept. That's why I'm going to demand term like, like this, uh, the new supply term, like it, it doesn't matter. Even if we draw it like this, we can still get our new equilibrium and all that. So this is the new equilibrium point, which means that this is going to be the new price. Okay, this is going to be the new price. Let's call this P1. This price is called P1. So what did we say about CS? For CS, we are talking about the portion below the demand curve, but above what? Above price. And now this is the new price. So this is going to be our new CS. And is this small triangle here? We are left with what? Only A, okay? We are left with only A. Please, are we following? Okay. Yeah. Yes, it's just going to be this side here. Just this A. That's why, mm -hmm. that's why I stated that now the CS after the tax. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just I'm going to going to then if you want to find the producer surplus after the tax, you extend this line, let it touch the old supply curve. Then you trace it to the price line. This is the new price that the firm is going to accept. Wow. So this will be the new price for the producer. Let's call it three point five. Okay. So if you want the new producer surplus, remember it is the portion above the supply curve, but below the price. So that is this part that we, we have here. Oh, I'll change the. Okay, that's this part here, okay? So we have only this triangle, this small triangle, and the area of this triangle is D. So PS after taxes, only D. Then if you want the, the government tax revenue, this is the, the tax per unit. For each um, quantity that they sell, they pay a tax of a difference between P1 and P2. This P1 and this P11. And then the quantity that is going to be produced will be at this quantity here, at this side here, okay? So if you are looking for total tax revenue, it's these two triangles, B and then C, okay? B and then C. So if you look at this, it's not part of the question, but for you to get a deeper understanding, the B was part of the CS before the tax, right? You see that B was part, part of CS, but then that portion is now going to the government as a tax revenue. And then C was initially part of a PS. You, re you realize that, but now it is going to the government as a tax revenue. Okay, so now the total government revenue will be the sum of B and then C. This portion here, this portion E, okay? This portion E, this E was initially part of CS, but now it is neither going to the consumer nor the government as revenue. So this is a dead weight loss to the entire society. The society has lost this welfare here. And then if you come to F, it was initially part of PS. Now it is neither going to the government, it's neither going to the Fed. So this one too is a dead weight loss. Okay, so the dead, dead weight loss here is the sum of E and then F. So if you have to compare the uh, post tax and then the pre tax, for CS, pre tax was the sum of E, A, and B, but the post tax it becomes, which means we have lost E and then B to the tax. And then if you take PS, initially was F, C, and B, now it's only D, we have lost C and then F. Then we have lost B and C to the government. That is what we call the tax revenue. And then E and F, we've lost it, but it's not going to the government. That's what we call the dead weight loss. Is that okay? Yes, please. All right. Mm -hmm. So that is that. All right. Let's check the next one. Assume a perfectly competitive firm has the following outputs and then price level for goods and services in Adansi Group. 
find a profit for each level of output and state the maximum output where the profit is maximized. So we have been given this table. The columns are quantity price, total revenue, total cost, and then we have profit. Okay, we have been given total cost. Profit is total revenue minus total cost. Total revenue minus total cost. The amount of money you make from sales minus the amount of money that you, you incurred when you were producing the commodity, okay? So first we need total revenue. Since we already have total cost, we need total revenue to find our total cost. So let's look at the table. So I just will produce the table. To find total revenue, total revenue is price times quantity. Okay, total revenue is price times quantity. Just assuming you are selling balls of pinky. One ball is two CD. If you sell 10 balls, how much money are you receiving? You are receiving 10 times two, which is 20 Ghana CDs. So total revenue is always price times quantity, okay? So if you want the total revenue for the first one, that will be price, which is 10 times quantity, which is 20. That gives us for 200. If you want the next one is 10 times 30, that is giving us for 300. 10 times 35, that is giving us 350, okay? Now, so you, you do it for all the levels. The price is constant because we are under a competitive market. And the perfect competition, the firms are price taken. So price is constant throughout. It doesn't matter the quantity that you sell. The quantity is always fixed. That is why uh, the price is fixed, okay? Uh, it's even a question that they can ask. They can give you a table and then they will ask you, is a firm operating under perfect competition or monopoly? If it's under perfect competition, the price will always be constant. If it's under mo monopoly, then as the firm is trying to sell more, price will reduce. So always uh, in a response to that question, check price. If price is constant, then you just go for perfect competition, okay? So now we have total revenue, we have total cost. So to find your profit, you do it for each level, okay? So the first one, total revenue is 200 minus total cost of what, 300. That is going to give us so 200 minus uh, then 300, and that gives us minus 100. So this means the firm is making a loss, right? The cost is more than the revenue. Is that okay? Yes. And then we go to the next one, 300 minus uh, 320. That will give us minus 20. We are still in the red. Then 350 minus 330, that gives us positive 20. So you do it for all the le levels, 370 minus 280, 90. Do it for all the levels and hopefully these are the profits that you are getting. Okay, so we are done with the first part, uh, finding the profit. And then the second one where to find the quantity that must be produced in order to maximize profit. Now, if you want to know where to maximize profit, just, just check the profit column. Okay, if you check your profit column, what is the highest profit? It's 90, right? 90. And when do we get this highest profit? What output should we produce? 37. So when you produce output 37, profit is maximized. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Let's look at a question on demand and supply. Using the schedules given, plot the demand curve and the supply curve. Level the axis and indicate for each axis the units being used to measure price and quantity. Then answer the questions. So we have price, we have quantity demanded, and then the quantity supplied, okay? I'm sure we can see the relationship between price and demand, relationship between price and then the quantity supplied as well. As price is falling, quantity demanded is increasing. But as price is falling, quantity supplied is also falling. I'm sure you remember the inverse relationship between demand and then price and then the positive relationship between supply and price, okay? Now, the first question, give the equilibrium price and quantity for oats. Hey, even there's a first one that we have to draw the demand curve and then the supply curve, right? So this is what we do. We are just using the given information. So label the price axis 
and then label the quantity as this. You see, there was a specific instruction that you state the units in which price and quantity are being measured. Price is being measured in dollars, then the quantity is being measured in bushels of oats. Okay, so uh, you do that first. Then the prices, you do the prices. These are the prices from 1.5 to, uh, from one to 1.5. So we have one, 1.1, 1.2 up to 1.5. Then you do the quantities as well, okay? So this is how we do it. When price is one, you go and check the quantity demanded. It was 35,000. So you just inscribe a point. Then when price is 1.1, quantity demanded is uh, 30,000. You will do it up to 1.5. When price was 1.5, uh, the quantity demanded was 10,000. So after getting all these points, you draw a line through these points. You get your demand. Okay, so please, you have to label it. I didn't label it yet. So you make sure you do your DD here, okay? Then when it comes to the quantity supplied or the supply curve, when price was one, quantity supplied was 15,000. 1.1 was 2,000. So you do it for all the prices. Then you draw a line through it. This is your supply curve. So at this point here, I'm sure we'll be asked to find equilibrium. At this point, we have our equilibrium price and then equilibrium quantity. So equilibrium price is 1.2. Equilibrium quantity is 25,000. When you are stating then please add the quantities. So $1.2 as equilibrium price, and then 25,000 bushels of oats as equilibrium quantity, okay? You could have even used the table. If you check the table, we'll have equilibrium where quantity demanded is equal to quantity supply. And it's when the quantities are 25,000 and price is 1.2, okay? So we have done that. Now we've done the D2 where to indicate the equilibrium price and quantity. That is what we did here. Okay, so this P, this P, check it though. We were asked to label them P and Q. So you do see, okay. Now, if the federal government decided to support the price of oats at 1.4, 1.4, so now price is being fixed or set at 1.4. Tell whether there will be a surplus or a shortage and how much it would be. So first, what exactly is a shortage? What is a surplus? We have a shortage when quantity demanded is more than quantity supplied. And that one occurs below the equilibrium price. When prices are very low, there's an increase in quantity demanded. There's a reduction in quantity supply, so it causes shortage. But then if price is set above the equilibrium price, like what you see here, 1.4, we have a surplus here, Quantity supplied will be more than quantity demanded. So if you look at, let's use the table, you get it better. There. At a price of 1.4, you just draw a line through the price. Okay, where does it touch the demand curve? At this point, the demand, the quantity demanded is what, 15,000. Where does it touch the supply curve? 35,000. So you see that firms are willing to sell 35,000 Producers are only willing to buy 15,000. So there's a surplus here. Okay, there's a surplus here. So if you have to calculate the exact surplus, then it's 35,000 minus 15,000. And that should give us 20,000. Okay, 35,000 minus 15,000. That should give us 20,000. So that's a surplus. That's okay. And then we have to indicate it on the graph. So that is what. I've done here. So this distance here is the surplus. I hope you understand. All right. Now, the Cowbell Company produces milk powder in Ghana. A tin currently sells from the factory at 20 Ghana cities each, but it costs 25 Ghana cities each to produce. That is average cost out of that average total cost is 10 cities. And then average variable cost is 15 cities. So the, this is the cost per one thing. That's what we call the average cost. But the average cost is decomposed into average fixed cost and then average 
variable cost. So the average fixed cost is the cost on the fixed input incurred for producing just one unit. Then the average variable cost is the cost incurred on the variable input. I'm sure you know that in the short term, whatever output you produce, you combine fixed inputs and then variable inputs, okay? So um, here, the, the cost incurred on the fixed inputs are what you call the average fixed cost, and then the ones on the variable inputs are what you call the variable cost. Now, uh, the, the idea about here, we call it the shut down decision of a firm, the shut down decision of a firm. What we need to understand is that for fixed costs, fixed costs are fixed. It doesn't matter whether you produce or not. Fixed costs are fixed, okay? So whether you produce or not, you incur that, that cost. So assuming the firm shuts down, okay? Assuming that the firm shuts down, you will still incur a loss of what? Loss of 10 Ghana cities, which is the first cost. If you don't produce at all, you shut down. So if you shut down, then the total loss that you incur here is going to be the cost on the fixed input. That is 10. But then as soon as you start to, if you don't produce anything, you don't use any variable input. So you don't incur any variable cost. But as soon as you begin to produce, then you start to incur a variable cost. So now, as long as you produce one, one thing of milk and you are paying uh, 15 Ghana cities on the variable inputs, then now, after you are done producing, you have to go and sell your goods at a price of P. So at which price level should you shut down? In other words, at which price level should you stop producing? Okay, so now let's, let, let's even forget about the question. Let me give you the understanding then to we'll come up to the question. Now, the, the condition is that we only shut down when price is less than average variable cost. Okay, when price is less than average variable cost. So now let's assume that these are the cost information that we have. And then you charge a price of, let's say, um, okay, let's use the 20 as the person is saying, a price of what, 20, okay? You have incurred a, an average face cost of 10, an average variable cost of 15. So the total cost that you are getting here per that quantity is 25 Ghana CDs. But after you finish, you are selling your thing for 20 Ghana CDs. So the question is that should you shut down or you should continue producing? So this is what you do. Compare the price to average variable cost. Average variable cost is 15, price is 20. You, you can pay off all the average variable cost, right? You pay everything off and you still be left with what? Five Ghana CDs. And you can use this five Ghana CDs to also go and pay part of the face cost. So it will only be left with what? A face cost of five. So if you produce and you charge a price of 20, you are only incurring a loss of five. Your loss is five. One boka, five Ghana CDs. Okay? But if you didn't produce at all, your loss is going to be your average face cost of 10. So please, I'm asking you if you were the firm, would you co continue producing and sell the ten of milk at a price of 20 or you, you shut down? I'm continue to sell. Why? We produce, our loss is only five cities, but if we don't produce our store, the loss is 10 cities. And 10 is higher than five, so we continue. Yeah, so you see that it's just wise that you continue producing. Because if, if your price is able to cover all the average variable costs, then you'll be able to use the remainder to be free part of your face cost. So producing will be better than not producing. So if you look at the first one, they are saying that the chief accountant has advised the board to shut down the factory because the firm incurs a loss of five, Ghana cities for every tin of milk powder it produces. That is true. Like they are making a loss of five because you are incurring a cost of 25, but then you are selling it for 20 Ghana cities. So you are making a loss of five. But economically, the price is able to cover all the average variable cost. So don't shut down. You are even paying part of your loss. 
of your face course. So don't shut down, continue pro producing. So for this one, we will not agree with the accountant. He's an accountant, so for him, he's just uh, interested in profit, okay? So don't shut down. And the reason is what you gave. Your price is covering all your average variable costs and you are defraying part of your uh, face course will continue producing. But let's look at another scenario where you charge a price of 15. If you charge a price of 15, okay? If you charge a price of 15, it means your price and your average variable cost are the same, right? They are the same. So here, the, the total loss is going to be the face cost of 10. If you produce, you are incurring a loss of 10. If you don't produce, you are incurring a loss of 10. So here, the firm will be indifferent between producing or not producing because the effect is the same, okay? But economically, it is advised that the firm doesn't shut down because at least you're able to cover your variable because you keep on producing, hoping that in the future, things are going to get better. There, the, there are several reasons why we encourage firms to produce even if their price is exactly equal to average variable cost. Okay, one the, one, the first reason is that you are hoping that in the future, prices might go up. If price should just go to 16, you cover all the variable costs and pay part of the first cost. So don't stop. Continue producing, hoping that things will get better in the future, okay? And also, um, uh, uh, one reason why we advise them to continue producing is just to keep skilled labor. You have hired people. We go through screening processes, interviews, that there's a cost attached to hiring labor. You've hired them. If you shut down, they will all go. If you are coming to start again, you have to go and pay all those things again and bring those people, people back. So just not to lose your skilled labor, you continue producing. Another reason too is that just to keep your customers you, you are not making a profit, but because you are covering all your variable costs, for the sake of those who are buying your product, you, you don't stop. You keep on producing. There are several reasons to, to that, okay? So one of our price is exactly equal to average variable costs. We don't shut down either. So if you look at the II, we are saying that at I, we've said, no, they shouldn't shut down. So we don't agree with the accountant. For II, will your view change? If average variable cost is no more 15, but 20. If average variable cost is equal to 20, then it's exactly equal to price. So it's just like the analysis that we just did. If price is exactly equal to average variable cost, still the firm shouldn't shut down. Don't shut down, continue producing, hoping that things will get better. So even I, I too, we still advise the firm doesn't shut down. Are we together? Are we together? Yes, please. Okay. Then let's look at yes. I, 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 I. Yes, please. I, I, I. Now, average variable cost is 30. What are we seeing here? Your average cost, average variable cost is 30. You are charging a price of 20. It means that you are not even able to cover your average variable cost. So here, if you produce, your total loss is going to be 20. You only pay 20 out of the 30 average variable costs. You still be left with a loss of 10 here. Then you add it to the average face cost of 10. So here, if you produce, you are incurring a cost, a loss of 20. If you don't produce, you are incurring a loss of 10. Then it's better you don't produce at all. Are we together? So for I, 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 for I, 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 the firm should shut down because the price is less than average variable cost. And then the person is not even uh, able to cover up for the average variable cost. So at III, the firm must shut down. Is that okay? Yes. Uh, for the IV, the, this one can just Google it. You, you, you get it. Cost is very important. One, we use cost to derive firm supply curve. Uh, we will use the cost information to know the uh, the output level that must be produced in order to maximize uh, profit. I just Google this one. I'm sure you get quite a lot of information. So uh, these are the explanations that I was given.
Now uh, we have to use a straight line demand. Please, the, the meeting is going off soon. Eh? When, when it goes off, then we will connect again. Use a straight line demand curve to show that the price elasticity of demand varies from one point to another.